Okay, hi guys. It's me, Erin Minkley, author of Artists Who Thrive, and this is my second podcast on a video, and it's been really fun to create content for you that's going to be on YouTube rather than just hearing an audio podcast. So I wanted to summarize what's been going on for the last two weeks since the last time I recorded. And I have to preface with, yes, my voice is kind of strained because I've been making so many phone calls in the last week and actually the last month. I have just feel like I've been on the phone for at least four or five hours a day. So to let anyone know that's not been following along on my journey. What I'm doing right now is I'm on the road to a million dollars trying to uh, self-fund a venture, which I'm the owner of a wallpaper company. I'm a boutique wallpaper design firm and I have my own product line, but I'm interested in purchasing a wallpaper manufacturing operation, so a printing um, press and uh, all of the things that go along with owning this manufacturing operation. So uh, if you want to hear a little bit more about the journey to finding an investor, check out the podcast that came before this, the first video podcast. What I wanted to talk about today, because I don't have a ton of updates as far as where I'm at in the process, I'm still looking for the right amount of money, the investor, and signing the lease on this property that ha hosts all of the printing presses and machinery. Um, instead, I'm going to go into something that I talk about in the book, Artists Who Thrive. So if you guys haven't gotten a copy, you can find it on Amazon or you can find it on my other website called profitableartist.org and you will get a signed copy if you go to that website. So what I've been acutely aware of in the last three months since I started this adventure into fundraising for a big, big, big business is a couple of things are glaringly obvious for me. As I'm seeking support, I have to be really conscious of how I'm presenting myself to these investors, how I'm presenting the information in spreadsheets, in a PowerPoint presentation, in a pitch deck, and how I'm speaking to people that are going to be potential clients, having all of my information ready. But it's not enough to have all of your information uh, beautifully arranged in a couple of slides. What I'm aware of right now, and it keeps getting pointed out to me, in fact, is that I have a couple factors working against me. And most of these things we all have when we come up with a really big, cool idea. There's going to be stumbling blocks. There's going to be, you know, barricades, as I feel they've been in blocking me from succeeding. And some of those blocks are constructed, like mental blocks. Some of them are limitations put on us by others, and some of them are just circumstance. So I'm going to break down the things that I perceive to be my barriers to entry. So the first thing is that I'm a woman, <laughs> as you can see by looking at me, and I'm a woman-owned business. So as much as we'd love to believe that being a woman-owned business gives us a leg up because of some kind of certification or people are going to want to work with me because I'm a woman-owned business, um, I'm having to work a lot harder to prove that I'm not full of shit than a man would. And I'm having to prove to the landlord that I have enough money 
to rent the space, so I'm acutely aware of my financial standing and my socioeconomic place. Because if I were rich, I could just walk into any room and someone would listen to me because they know there's a benefit to working with me. But when I'm open about the fact that I don't have any assets, I don't have the funds to make something happen, I'm looking for support. I wouldn't be looking for support if I had a million dollars already, right? I would just say, I have a million dollars and I want this. So I'm having to kind of grapple with the fact that when I'm honest about that, other people perceive something. And the last one is a social role. So what I mean by that is I'm a mother and I have many different um, chores and tasks and jobs. Um, not all of them are focused on my business. And I'm being pulled in so many different directions. I don't have endless hours in the day like I would have before having kids. And I um, believe that even men with kids don't necessarily have to put their business aspirations second to their children most of the time. So there's a unique standpoint that I have in trying to fundraise a million dollars as a woman, as a business owner, as a mother, and as someone who really doesn't come from means. I'm not a woman with a, net, a high net worth. And so getting someone to listen to you when you come from this um, standpoint is extremely difficult. And I talked in the last video about how, you know, all of these different stumbling blocks and all of these different challenges, at every point along the way, I could have just said, you know what, this is too hard, I'm gonna quit. I want to give up. Um, this isn't for me. The answer is not clear, so I'm just going to leave it dead in the water. But with this idea that I'm extremely passionate about, which is growing my business by 20 times and keeping a screen printed wallpaper factory alive and supporting a dying art form, um, giving jobs to other people, I see so much benefit to not only me, but others, and I have to pursue this goal. I have to pursue it until I know that I did everything humanly possible to try and make it work. And if at the end it doesn't work, then at the very least I can say, I did everything. I did everything I could. I talked to every single person until my voice uh, expired. I called everyone I know. I um, went on every website. I tried to find funding in every place I could. I applied for all the loans. I applied for all the grants. And, and I didn't make it work because then I won't spend the rest of my life wondering what would have happened if I would have just made six more phone calls. Would I have found my dream client? Would I have found an opportunity I'm hiding under a rock somewhere? And so I'm leaving no stone unturned. But two things come up for me that are parallels to my story. One is a client that I work with. She's a coaching client and a creative. And her story I'm going to share a little bit about in, because it made me think about a story in this book, um, a metaphor that I came up with while I was writing Artists Who Thrive. And it's called The Big Peel, and I'm going to explain that in a little bit. The other parallel that came to mind this week as I, my kids went off to their dad's house and I had Thursday night to myself, I decided to put on sweatpants and sit on the couch and watch the Martha Stewart documentary. Guys, if you haven't seen it, you should go watch it. And this is not just for women. Like, everyone should watch this uh, documentary because it's really well done and it kind of um, places Martha Stewart in this really badass um, role that I believe that she earned. So 
Martha Stewart was the first self-made female billionaire. And I don't know about you, but that gets me very excited. Just thinking about the sheer um, persistence that was required to get to that point. Um, I didn't know that Martha Stewart had worked for a short period of time on the New York Stock Exchange. She made a tremendous amount of money as the only woman working on the stock exchange uh, floor. She was a beautiful blonde and at the time um, before she had kids and she was able to really crunch um, all of her time into that one position until she just didn't want to do it anymore and then she quit. So that was inspiring to me and the legacy that she built for herself, um, it wasn't easy. The road for her was filled with um, turmoil at many different points. Obviously, she went to prison for a short period of time and was able to bounce back. So that's pretty fucking cool. Um, but also, you know, she ended a marriage in the middle of her career and had to um, raise her daughter by herself and, um, you know, work work extra hard to make all of her dreams come true as a, as a single mother. So that part I found very inspiring as well. Um, but she's a woman of means, right? And so she had some money, she built an empire. Yay, good for Martha. Like, I don't really think I have a lot in common with her per se, uh, because she doesn't have that constraint that I have of like not coming from a family with money. She actually didn't come from a family with money, but she, you know, she, she worked really hard with, before having children. So, um, here we are. I love that, uh, coincidence that I watched that show and it sort of spurred some kind of inspiration in me. Um, you don't, you don't get to hear stories like that often, you know, and one thing I will say is that if you go down the rabbit hole of self-help books and podcasts, um, on business and startups and, um, all what it takes to really get to a place of wealth with your idea, you're going to find a lot of male influencers and you're going to find a lot of people that just continuously say, work harder, put in more time, stay up all night if you have to and grind. And that kind of masculine energy is everywhere in this uh, space, which again, doesn't apply to me because I have to put someone to bed at 9 p.m. and I got to wake up at 6 a.m. and pack that kid's lunchbox and get them off to school. And my work day is so limited due to my circumstance of being a mom. And so, you know, thank you so much, Gary Vee, but no, that is not going to work out for me. That is not a strategy that's going to work for any working mom. Um, or any devoted parent who is splitting their time between their career vision and the everyday work of being a family member. So really it comes down to like, what's the deciding factor because we all have a vision, we all have dreams, we all have hopes, we all have goals, and you can work with a coach and come up with goals. But like, what's the difference between you and Martha Stewart? Like, why couldn't you become the first uh, billionaire, um, whoever you are, right? Single mom. Um, and, I, and I'm thinking about where, where do we go wrong? Where, where do we lose that sense of vision and authenticity and being sure of ourselves? And why do we just decide to like resign? Because resignation is usually the end of the, the pursuit of that goal. And it's so easy to quit. It's so easy when you have all these uh, factors holding you back or preventing you from success. Um, 
you know, in the business world, they call them barriers to entry. There's so many barriers to entry. If it was easy, everyone would be doing it. So I want to draw a picture and, and explain a little metaphor to you that comes from the book, and it's called The Big Peel. So I'm actually going to draw you guys a picture right now. Um, I have a little intro sheet so that you'll remember this um, metaphor. So here we have an onion, and I picture it as a red onion. And on the outside layer of this onion, we have like a really crispy, flaky outer um, shell that looks a little disheveled and, you know, very easily comes off if you pull it. This outside layer is our protection. This, if you're the onion, this is you. This outer shell is the thing that people see from the outside. And it's the thing that's actually been built up over time due to life being hard, due to all the environmental and circumstantial things about your life. And it does, it does protect the next layer down from being hurt, right? And that's why it's kind of beat up. It's why it's kind of dry and crispy. It's been exposed to the elements. So all of us have that outer layer and all of us have what it is to be perceived by others as something. Um, so imagine in the grocery store, you have all these onions in a big pile and nobody's gonna pick like the moldiest looking one. Nobody's gonna be um, drawn to that one. But we all know when shopping for onions that you can easily just peel back that layer and then there's a more beautiful layer. I'm kind of doing this like as if I sliced it in half and you can kind of see there's another layer underneath there, right? And that layer looks a little better. It's a little shinier. It's a little darker purple. But even under that one is another layer. And then we start to get to the more um, tender part of this vegetable. But as we keep going inwards, what happens? What usually happens? Well, number one, our eyes are going to fill with tears because cutting open an onion um, often makes us cry. But we start to see it change colors a little bit as we go down deeper and deeper and deeper. And then by the time we get to the center, this is usually the part of the onion that you like throw away, right? Because it doesn't have the same kind of powerful punch of, of flavor. Finally, finally, we get to this. The little teeny tiny guy in the middle. And in my metaphor of the big peel, as we start to take off some of these layers of circumstance, we finally get down to the truest part of ourself. So this is me. That's who I really am way deep down inside. And all these layers offer us protection from being vulnerable. This little guy in the middle is our authentic self. And that's who we really are. But what people actually see is this. And they see our circumstance. Like, oh, she didn't grow up in a rich family. That's a circumstance. It's not who I really am. We have conditioning. A 
Like good mothers spend time with their children. They don't work until 9 p.m. That is conditioning. It's someone told me that was the idea that I was supposed to have about being a mother. We have um what was the other word you used? Conditioning. We have um another layer of societal expectations. Like women should be successful, women should dress a certain way, have a certain body type, um, express themselves in a certain way. And so we have these expectations put around us that are really not truly who we are. If we, if we really thought about how we wanted to communicate, we might just tell it how it is. We might just say exactly what's on our mind. And interestingly, Martha Stewart got herself a reputation for being a bitch. If a man had acted the way that Martha had acted, he would be called a shark and a great businessman. And so we have gender roles. We have all kinds of things that block this little guy from coming full on out and flying his freak flag. He's got one after another after another shell protecting him so that the outside world can accept him. And truth be told, it's very hard for this authentic self to make itself known with all this stuff surrounding it. Nobody really knows what's in here until you start to peel off these layers of expectations and conditioning and circumstance. And so we get to choose if we're going to leave these layers on and be accepted, or if we're going to shed some of these things and say, you know what, I don't buy into that. I'm going to do it anyway. And I'm going to show up as authentically as I can. And as you start to peel down the layers, wouldn't you assume that things are going to be easier because you're just being authentically you. Wouldn't you assume that everyone's going to like that more? When really what ends up happening is you are more likely as your authentic self to make people uncomfortable. And the reason why people get uncomfortable when you show up authentically, when you advocate for yourself, when you speak your mind, when you stand your ground, when you say, no, that's not how this is going to work. And when you express your vision of things is that people are going to try to tell you no. People are going to try to tell you how to dress, how to act, how to behave, or they may say, oh, I don't do business with people that speak this way or talk about politics or um, have this or that religious beliefs or um, drive that kind of car, right? I've experienced this in the last month with many different people involved in my process. And those are the kinds of like limitations that I feel are set in front of me, preventing me from getting ahead. 
So I have the choice to, to decide, am I going to conform? Am I going to be submissive? Am I going to play the game, the game, the way that the game was created? Because the game was created for men, let's be honest. And the game is being played by men. And so I have to either do it the way that they have done it um, or do it my own way and then threaten the system and the patriarchy. And it's going to end up potentially making me unlikable. And so I want to bring in my client's story. Uh, she and I have been working together for almost 10 months. And she is pursuing her dream to be an artist. She was formerly working in interior design and many different roles. And now she's taken some time for herself to have a studio practice and create different paintings, photos, and and uh, lots of fine art work. And her fear is that she's going to continue uh, making things, but not succeed. And I think even fear is a layer of the onion, just fear in general, not fear of anything specifically, but just fear. It holds us back from showing up authentically. And what it boiled down to in our coaching session was fear of doing all of this alone. And I had to bring in a story of mine from when I very first did the ballsiest thing I've ever done, which was my Kickstarter campaign where I raised $20,000 to start Relativity Textiles. And I remember being fully funded on the 50th day, which was 10 days before the deadline. And it happened at midnight and everyone in my house was asleep. My kids were asleep, my husband, at the time was asleep and he had just come home from a long trip. He's a flight attendant. So he was sleeping after 16 hours being in a plane. And I thought to myself, like, should I go in there and wake him up and jump on the bed and say, Oh my God, I just raised $20,000. Like see, uh, celebrate with him and get him to celebrate with me. Or should I just sit with this information? And our relationship was rocky at best at this time in my life. And I think for part of the reason I wanted to start my own business was because I wanted something to feel um, completely mine and have some success at something. And it was that ambition that really drew, drove me to say, OK, I'm going to ask my friends for money. Like, I'm going to seek support and I'm going to do a Kickstarter and it may be um, very humbling to do that. I kind of felt like I was just standing on the side of the freeway asking for money with a cardboard sign, but ultimately that's not how it ended up feeling when it was fully, fully said and done. And I decided I was just gonna wait for him to ask me, how's the Kickstarter going? And he woke up in the morning and he made some tea and he had breakfast and he took a shower. And all the while I'm just sitting there like, when is he gonna ask? And in fact, he went to work and he left for three days on a flight and he came back. And when he finally got back, I had been sitting with that information for a really long time. So I was like, oh, when is he gonna ask? And he finally said, hey, how's the uh, starter kick thing? And I said, oh, I am fully funded. And he's like, wait, what? What does that mean? I was like, oh, I raised all the money that I was seeking to raise. And he's like, really? And he was dumbfounded for a minute that I actually succeeded. And this is like, guys, this is the person that's supposed to love me the most in this world. And he couldn't even muster the word, words, congratulations, babe. This is awesome. And so what I told my coaching client is that 
sometimes, unfortunately, what happens is as you create an ambitious goal, as you achieve that ambitious goal, as you find a support network, as you um, overcome the challenges of some great big idea, and you see your vision start to come to life, it can be a very isolating process. Because what happens when you shed all of these layers and you really stand out and become this little guy it makes people quite uncomfortable. They're like, what are you doing running around authentically and being visible and shouting from the mountaintops who you really are? Don't you know we're all doing this? This is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to have what's called pretense. We have our Instagram following. We talk about the 10% of our life that's the fanciest. We never show our dirty laundry basket. We never show our gray hair. We never show the part of us that's struggling, the part of us that's about to burst into tears. Why are you going around being so true to yourself? Why are you going around expressing your vision? Some people may be threatened by you. Some people may be jealous of you. Some people may be offended by your ability to just say what you want to say. And this is why Martha Stewart got a bad rap because she was a visionary. She had a very strong idea of how every single thing in her life was supposed to look and taste and smell. And she was not satisfied and wouldn't settle for less than what her vision was. And if somebody cut the hedges wrong, she came and grabbed the scissors from their hand and said, no, you do it like this. And that can be very threatening to other people. So as we peel back the skin and the layer and the crustiness and the ugliness of the onion, we're bound to make people cry. We're bound to shed some friends. We may even disrupt our industry. We may even disrupt our family dynamic. And it can be very isolating. But does that mean that it's not worthwhile? Sometimes we have to make choices about the people that we keep in our lives just because they like the pretense of how we look on the outside or how we behave in Instagram. It can be dangerous to share your political views. It can be dangerous to stand up for the underdog. It can be threatening to express your true opinions and likes and dislikes. It can be just very vulnerable to be a visionary. And so I believe that's why most people don't do it. They don't want to be isolated. They don't want to be outcasted. They don't want to be involved in the witch hunt. And so it can lead to a, a tremendous amount of scrutiny and it can lead to a lot of um, complications. And so wouldn't you know it, it's easier to resign than it is to be alone and do hard things. 
or face rejection. And so this is what I told my client is that as you peel back one layer at a time, and let's say it takes a month just to peel back one layer, and let's say there's 20 different layers, you're releasing some of the previous challenges that you didn't want to have, like circumstances. You're rejecting the notion that a mother is supposed to put everyone else before herself and put yourself first. But by gosh, people are going to have some feedback for you. So if you don't want any feedback, don't do it. And if you don't want to have challenges, then surely you should resign. But resignation is hard to bounce back from. It's hard to get closer to your authentic self at the same time. So as we view it from the coaching paradigm, the stronger you know who you are and the more that you hold true to this little guy in the center, it takes work to find who it is. It takes a lot of digging deep down and finding your vision. And it requires you releasing a lot of your excuses and a lot of your pretending and a lot of the bullshit of all the other people that surround you to get here. But the more you know who you are, the easier it is to continue down the path without wanting to quit and being afraid to fail. So that, my friends, is what I'm referring to as the big peel. And if you want to hear a little bit more metaphors, funny stories, some sad stories, but in the end, it all turns out to be part of my process of becoming a business owner and an artist and a mom and maybe soon raising a million dollars to start a new business. Check out the book, Artists Who Thrive, and follow the, like and follow this uh, podcast for more. <laughs>